Well, hello, hello, my friends, and welcome to today's top leaders. I am so excited to be here today to share with you information that's going to help you to be that leader that everyone wants to work for. And we have a wonderful guest with us today. I'm very excited to invite Dr. Sarah Webb to today's top leaders. Sarah, thank you so much for coming on. Hi, I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Yeah. So good. So we're going to cover her bio and then we're going to jump into this conversation today. So Dr. Sarah L. Webb is the founder of Colorism Healing, a global leader in raising awareness, shifting attitudes, and taking action to address colorism with corporate, consumer, and community strategies. So Sarah, before we go into all this stuff about colorism and DEI and whatnot, I'm going to throw you some rapid fire questions. Are you ready for this? Yeah, I hope so. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> of course you are. Yeah. Here we go. All right. Salty or sweet? Salty and sweet. And sweet. And salted oh. caramel. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, that Chicago mix. Holy. Yeah. Okay. All right. What's your favorite book today? My favorite book today is The Body is Not an Apology by Sonia Renee Taylor. Ooh, sheesh. Okay. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Gosh. Okay. I love it. Okay. Uh, let's say you get to travel one place right now. Where do you want to go? I want to go to Kenya. Nice. So good. I have a friend heading there soon. Hey. Humanitarian <laughs> tours. It's fabulous. Okay. Yeah, cool. All right. And what's your favorite song? All of the above. <laughs> I know. Okay. You got that playlist. I got you. All right. All right. <laughs> Moving on. What's your biggest pet peeve? My biggest pet peeve is pin clicking. I don't like clicky pins. <laughs> oh, that's a good, I've never heard that one. That's good. Okay. Yeah. That's funny. Now I'm never going to not be able to hear that. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then if a uh, favorite movie of all time. Oh, um, Favorite movie of all time. I'll have to say The Five Heartbeats. I'm going to go with that one. It's a childhood classic of mine. Okay. I don't know what that is. I'll have to go check that out. Okay. It's awesome. about a singing group. Okay. It sounds like it. So that's yeah. cool. Good. I love it. It's all music, music, music. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. And isn't it interesting how music is something, I mean, talking about DEI, colorism and whatnot, how music, wow, what a difference from one community to another and what it means and how it shows up. Wow. Yes. I I grew up listening to different types of music. And I think being from South Louisiana, we have a unique folkloric type of music called Zydeco, uh -huh. Z-Y-D-E-C-O. Yeah. Um, and then thinking about, you know, growing up with soul music and people always thought I was older than I was because I knew songs from a generation before me and things like that. So music has been a staple in my life. And I definitely think it's a good way to connect with other people because um, Stevie Wonder says music is the language that we all can understand. Mm, thank you, Stevie. He always has mm -hmm. good things to say. <laughs> yes, that's awesome. I love it. Man, I haven't heard the word Zydeco in a long time. Great. <laughs> That is a, Most, a lot of people have never heard of it. So you're doing good. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. I think I appreciate that. Um, wonderful. Yeah, it's so let's let's jump into this conversation about colorism and like let's start off with mm -hmm. what is colorism? Let's start with that. And I'm sure there's some other pieces we need to lay the ground, the foundation to even get there too. So let's just start. What is colorism? And then we'll we'll go from there. Yes. So I'll say that people of the same race, people who identify the same way racially can have very different skin tones. And so colorism is when people of the same race are treated differently, are valued differently because of differences in how light their skin tone is or how dark their skin tone is. Mm -hmm. And thinking about um, how we use color and race synonym synonymously a lot. I think that is often a hurdle for people to understand the difference. So realizing that color does not necessarily equate to a racial identity. Mm -hmm. mm, okay. Okay. There's so much about this to unpack. So, <laughs> all right. So let's, let's go with an example, right? So help mm -hmm. us with an example. You, you pick one that makes the most sense for you to explain for us. Okay. Yes. So I will use the example of um, there was a catalyst study that came out uh, this year that says that the darker a woman's skin tone, the more likely she is to experience racism at work, right? And mm -hmm. so they have this bar graph where they range the 
there's a range of human skin tones. And so the lighter the skin tone on that graph, the less likely that person was to have experiences of racism at work. And so this is for people across different racial groups. And I use personal examples as well, because my family is a multicolored family. So we have a range of skin tones. So in the, a lot of people recognize colorism at home before they recognize it out in the larger society, before they might be able to identify it at work. So my sister and I are very different skin tones. We have the same mother and the same father. So according to most people's understanding of race, we are the same race. Mm -hmm. And, but because she has lighter skin than I do, people have perceived her as being nicer or smarter or uh, Mm -hmm. more approachable. Right. And so I saw very early on how people were treating her differently than me or perceiving her differently than they were me because my skin was darker. Mm -hmm. Wow. Isn't that fascinating? Mm -hmm. So fascinating. Yeah. And I was aware of this at as early as five, if not sooner, because I was able to articulate it at five, which meant I probably had been seeing the pattern of Mm -hmm. treatment, Mm -hmm. you know, before that. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And you said she's younger than you? She's older. Oh, she's older. Excuse me. Okay. You're the younger one. Okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. How many, how many years older is she than you? Three years, three Three, years. Okay. Okay. So it's still pretty close. So it's not like she was 10 years older. So, right. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's Mm -hmm. fascinating. So, um, so talk, uh, it's just for, for context here in the conversation, can you share with us a little bit more about DEI as well? Like what is it? And Mm -hmm. and that piece too, because I know that this comes together. Yeah. So DEI is the acronym that stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And there are variations on that acronym. Some people like to switch the order of them and put equity first. Some people like to add a B for belonging or a J for justice. And so those are the, that's what the acronym stands for in general, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So diversity is having different people at the table or having different people in the room. And so that could be racial diversity, gender diversity, diversity of sexualities, diversity of languages, socioeconomic backgrounds. So diversity means that there's variety amongst the people at this organization or amongst the people in this um, context. And then equity is about So we have diverse people, but are they being treated equitably? Do they have the same access to resources? Do they have the same access to opportunities? Are they um, discriminated against more than others, right? And then inclusion is I'm in the room, I'm being paid equitably, I'm being treated fairly, but do I feel like I belong? Do I feel seen, right? Do I feel like I am a part of the zeitgeist or that the cultural dynamics in this place of work or this organization or this school or this family? Do I feel like I have a place that where I fit in that context? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love it. So, um, so then how does colorism fit into that DEI bubble, if you will, I'm saying a bubble because I'm just trying to put it into something in context, right? So Mm -hmm. how, how does it fit inside of that? Yeah. So on the diversity side, in terms of having people, uh, a variety of people at the table, I coined this phrase (laughs) monochromatic diversity, which is when we have people of different racial identities, people of different ethnic backgrounds, and yet they all have very light skin tones or very straight hair textures, right? And so they have what we call more European or Eurocentric features. And so you can look at a brochure, you can look at a company website, you can look at the company photo and say, well, there are people of different ethnicities and races here, but there aren't any people who are very dark skinned, right? Or who would appear darker than the the larger group. And in terms of the equity piece, you know, going back to pay inequalities, access to um, healthcare outcomes, access to educational attainment, and seeing that there are disparities even amongst people of the same race. And so that dark, the people with darker skin tones are disproportionately discriminated against compared to people of their same race who are lighter skin. And so that's where the equity piece comes in. And then when we think about inclusion, we also talk about Um, I I mentioned a lot that the EEOC, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, has settled multiple cases of people being bullied at work, people being called charcoal um, for having darker skin at work, right, by management or being told that their skin is too dark to appeal to white clients or to a white clientele. And so being made to feel like even though I was hired, even though I'm, you know, I'm getting paid to work here, people are making me feel like I'm the way I am is not good enough to be here. Mm-hmm. That 
Oh, I have like 7,000 questions going through my head. Okay. So, um, so in the workplace, when you're talking about, okay, let's, let's take two people who are both in sales. They both have college degrees. They both have, you know, work experience, you know, that, that made sense for them to be in that job. Right. So there's like some, you know, thing equal. So then if you have somebody, let's say, um, you know, of, of two different races, so let's say Asian and black, right. Or, or whatever it is. Okay. So or white and Hispanic or, or whatever it is. So you're saying that there's still stuff going on in the work world where you could have a manager say, sorry, Asian person, you can't work with that customer because of the way that you look or because it, because it need they need to go work with this, you know, somebody who's white or black or whatever, like that's still actually happening. Yes, that is still actually uh, happening. I'm, I'm going to go puke in my garbage can for a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the, the part of the, what makes it insidious though, is that the, the cases that have been settled by the EEOC are the more explicit instances of that. Yeah. But the the challenge, the real struggle is all of the implied instances where someone knows enough, they're savvy enough not to come right out and say that, but the person who's on the receiving end of that bias understands, right? Mm -hmm. They're reading between the lines. Like yeah. you're not going to come right out and say, I'm too dark to appeal to this clientele, mm -hmm. but there are enough cues and enough signals for me to get the message, right? And sometimes that's based on the pattern of who you put out front more, most often. Mm -hmm. I was talking mm -hmm. to someone in the surfing industry and hiring um, surfing brands, surfing companies, hiring models, casting for commercials and campaigns and ads and things like that. And so even if no one explicitly is saying um, you're too dark skinned to represent this brand, it's evident in their pattern, in their history of who they've cast in those roles and in those positions. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's the other thing too, is when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, it, it doesn't always have to be explicitly stated. There are other ways to indicate or to um, identify when a bias is at play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So with the with the surfing company, are they looking to have you help them see these biases? Is that what's going, why they're working with you? Yeah. So they're not working with me directly. I was consulting with the person who is working with them, who's right. an actual yeah. surfer. Right? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that's not um, an industry I have a lot of experience in, but that is, that was her goal, right? And why she reached out to me is because she was seeing that in her industry specifically. And what happens is where she is, is that they aren't, the company she's working with at least aren't seeing it or they aren't at a, at a point where they've identified it as a problem. And so her goal is to raise that awareness yeah. amongst the surfing community, mm -hmm. amongst the surfing, um, some surfing companies, is they are apparently not aware that this is a problem, or even if they are, they don't see it as a priority in terms of addressing it. So her goal and her mission is to, one, make sure that people are seeing it as a problem and understand why it's problematic and then hopefully spur them on to want to seek change in that way. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm so glad that there are people who are seeing this. That's all. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Right. Um, I remember when you came into my circle, I don't even remember months and months ago, right. When we mm -hmm. first crossed paths and we had this conversation and then I was traveling somewhere and I saw this billboard and I'm like, Oh, it was like the mm -hmm. first time I was aware of colorism. Yeah. Like to actually give it a, like a name, right. Mm -hmm. a, a thing I'm, you know, and basically it was a, it was, I don't even remember what the ad was for, but it was big, huge, big, huge poster. And, and it was, there was, they were showing a black woman, but she was about as white as you could get mm -hmm. and still being black, you know, right. you could, you know, so there, and so I would don't know that I would have ever have noticed it had I not had the conversation with you in advance. Right. Yeah. And, and so I think that's, that's a common piece of feedback that I get when people like watch my videos or they interact with me in any way, mm -hmm. they say, I can't stop seeing it now. And like, I'm mm -hmm. seeing it everywhere. It's kind of yeah. like once you, the light switch is on, you can't unsee, you can't unknow what you know now. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that is 
moving in the right direction, right? The more people who are able to just in their everyday, you know, at interactions, able to identify it and pinpoint it. And that language piece, I think it's so important having a term for something suddenly does make you able to identify it, does suddenly yeah. make you aware of it. Right. Um, I think the, when we have the language of colorism, it elucidates so much for people that in the past might have been like cognitive dissonance a little bit, like they might have felt um, something in the back of their minds that, oh, that, that's interesting. But once you have the language, then it kind of, you know, is brought to the forefront of mm -hmm. what actually is happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes sense. There are a lot of companies uh, that are trying to do something around DEI. Mm hmm. I mean, this isn't like this just popped up in the last 12 months or something, you know, there, right. it seems like there's quite a bit that's going on. So, so let's talk a little, let's kind of poke at the hornet's nest a little bit here mm -hmm. around. So is it working? Right. <laughs> is it, is it helping? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, me, I'm always willing to, you know, run to the things that are hard. <laughs> right. So let's well, talk about that. What What's your yeah. take on it? Well, I think we have to be willing to ask that question. I think not enough people are have the guts or the courage or the interest to actually ask, is it working? Because sometimes this has happened in a lot of arenas, but people will engage in DEI activities or DEI initiatives because they're being asked to do something. And doing something does not actually mean you're creating change, right? If the something that you're doing is not creating change, then it's as if you are doing nothing. And so yeah. I will say that writ large across, we'll, we'll keep it within the context of the United States. There is not enough change, there's not enough progress, but I think there are some opportunities, right? There are some moments when we see meaningful change, but there are still far too many people who are just doing it to check off a box. And one thing that I see very often that is an indicator of this is when we have things like employee resource groups who are not funded, right? And I always mm -hmm. say, we know what you value based on yeah. what you place a value on, <laughs> right? And so if there's not a line item, if there's not a budget allocated for these initiatives, that is indicative of, indicative of to what degree the leadership values DEI. And so thinking about how there are sometimes micro wins on the part of, you know, individuals or employees at the company, but in terms of macro systemic change, policy changes, protocol changes, um, bylaw changes, depending on the nature of the organization, I think we have yet to see that. And most people are still at the point of, unfortunately, there are so many people who are still at the point of, well, we just want to be able to start having uncomfortable conversations. Um, and so that conversation tends to keep the efforts at the interpersonal level. And so for a company to really get past the interpersonal dynamics and the, the mm -hmm. you know, introducing the topic and the awareness and actually start bringing people in to say, where in our policy, where in our actual norms and protocols and business practices and business strategies are we falling short in terms of actually providing equitable um, access and resources to our employees and making this an inclusive environment where everyone can thrive. So um, when you're just talking about where are we falling short, for example, mm -hmm. like are companies or groups finding that there's different perspectives on what we think we're falling short on, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one, we also have to say, we have to also have to put it out there that a lot of companies are struggling both sometimes at the executive level, sometimes at the senior level, and oftentimes at the entry level or employee level of people even understanding or believing that diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts are necessary, right? And so that's, I think, very telling that we're still in that phase for a lot of people. And so there's still not a consensus in some organizations, one, that this work should happen at all. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're even saying this at, you know, in state agencies, right, where there are like entire state governments who are saying no, no DEI and no diversity, equity, and inclusion. Right. Um, and so I think that's a big part of the challenge is that it's hard to make progress in DEI when there are so many people who still don't even think that it should be a thing at all. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing that we see happening culturally, but also within specific institutions and organizations. Um, but then thinking about 
when people say diversity, equity, and inclusion, a lot of times it feels like people who have historically or traditionally had more access and had more representation suddenly feel like they're losing something. And so that I think becomes where the, the difference in perspectives comes in as well. And so having the perspective that it's not diversity, equity, inclusion doesn't take away from anyone. It simply provides more opportunities for people who have been discriminated against in the past or who have not had equitable access to workplaces and to information and resources and capital in the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting commentary because they're, it's like, well, you know, everybody, everybody, I hate using the word should, but I'm going to say it right now. Everybody should have like access to all the things, right? Oh, anyhow, I even said it. I don't want to say should, you know what I mean? <laughs> but it's like, um, and it, you know, but it's, but it's, I guess we're, what's so interesting about this conversation is even in black communities, Hispanic communities, Asian communities, white communities, mm -hmm. the colorism, the, the, the racism that's happening within that, mm -hmm. right. is still very, very strong. Yes, it is. And I think that's my work is, is meant to help people who already understand what DEI is and why it's important, but they are, they, there's a missing link in terms of how effective their efforts are. And so when we think about racial equity and progress in terms of racial justice, I think if we just talk about racial categories without considering colorism, then we kind of are spinning our wheels in a rut and wondering why why aren't we making more progress on racism? Why aren't we getting yeah. further? Why aren't we seeing more change? And what I'm telling people is because colorism is part of the problem. And so if you are kind of missing part of the a key piece of the problem, then how can we hope to solve it? You know, and so I think when we look at diversity, equity, and inclusion writ large, all of these things sort of intersect. And so when we have, for example, someone of a certain race, we also have to say, but are their experiences representative of the entire race, right? And so we don't want to flatten the experience of people just because they all identify as Asian American. And we don't want to flatten the experience of people just because they all identify as women, for example. And right. realizing that even amongst women, we're going to have different experiences. We're going to have different life chances. We're going to have different life circumstances based on things like our, you know, physical ability, right? What, how do our bodies move and operate? What are our socioeconomic backgrounds? Were our parents college educated or not? So there are so many factors. And I think that can be a beautiful thing. Sometimes people say, oh, it's overwhelming. Now I have to consider all these differences. Um, but I think we can kind of shift the paradigm and say, well, actually that's kind of exciting. And that's really interesting, right? And seeing that you know, we're in a garden, if all the flowers and the grass and trees were all the same color and texture, then is the garden as rich and, you know, as much of an ecosystem as it could be if there was that diversity? And so I think realizing that just because people identify one way doesn't mean that their experience is the same as someone else who might also identify that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that analogy of a garden. That's so on mm. points, right? Because yeah. I don't want to go into a garden and everything's green, you know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. You know, but I've been in plenty of gardens where there's variations of green, exactly. right? And it's the right. variation of all that looks really, it's actually mm -hmm. quite lovely, right? Yeah. You know? And so, but then when you have those pops of pink and white and purple and whatever, mm -hmm. it's like, Ooh, it starts adding something. Um, yes. but, and then heights, right? You think of trees next to bushes, exactly. next to grass, you know, the yeah, shape all. of the plant, uh -huh. right? Like all those things can add texture and variety to, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, what the ecosystem ultimately turns out to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally love that. And it's, um, <laughs> uh, I, the reason I'm giggling a little bit is I was just thinking about how um, these biases that you're that you're putting out for conversation today are so pervasive, mm -hmm. and there's not a whole lot of five year old kids that are perceptive on it like you or Sarah. <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. wait a minute, why is my sister getting treated differently than me? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, 
<laughs> thank goodness you came to the world. So you had all these <laughs> perceptions, right? And I'm sure your parents at the time were like, oh boy, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so, yeah. but where I'm going with it is that I want to chat for a little bit about, okay, as leaders who are listening to today's top leaders and they're thinking, okay, okay, you've, you've made enough of a point. Yes. I do not want a garden. that's all just grass, you know, like help me, help me to have, you know, help me to see the, the different things. What are a couple of things that leaders can do to get started in even exploring? How are they going to even address it? Where, where would you get them started, Sarah? Yeah. Well, one, I, I like that you brought up, brought into the conversation more directly, the ter- idea of bias and how pervasive it is. And so A couple of things, depending on who the leader is and their level of comfort or um, experience in talking about DEI work is to one, understand that everyone has some form of privilege, right? And everyone has some role or participation in the larger social fabric, right? And so no one exists on an island. And I always try to say, we one, we can destigmatize privilege when we acknowledge that just we all have some form of it. And I like to role model that even though I have been historically marginalized for being a Black woman, I also have lots of privileges in terms of being a citizen of the country where I live, um, having a mom who went to college, um, being able-bodied, being cisgender. And so there are also these things that I don't have to worry about. There are these things that, um, you know, have made my life more equitable in terms of being able to yeah. literally move through space. And when we think about ability, physical ability, I think that's one that's most visible in terms of if the elevator is broken, I never in my life have to wonder how I'm going to get to the second floor, right? And that's a privilege Mm -hmm. to not have to worry about that or have that concern Mm -hmm. if the elevator is broken today. Um, And so I think that's a good place to start is for leaders. I I believe in starting from the inside out. I have, I'm actually designing a workshop called Start from the Heart. And I have this uh, diagram of concentric circles and how the center of circle is the individual level. And then outward from that, we have our relationships with other people. And then beyond that, we have institutions in the larger society, right? And so a change at one of these levels can have ripple effects across any of the other levels. And so if we all are, if we're all, if we all are willing <laughs> to look at ourselves and individually and see where we might have the most privilege, where we might have been historically marginalized or historically kept from certain opportunities, and then also be able to courageously self-assess, do I have any biases? And I think, again, normalizing the fact that we are we all have biases, also normalizing that. Because when we look at something like colorism, even a Black person can have a negative bias towards other Black people, right? So it's not saying that to point the finger because if we are seeing advertisements where all the women are skinny, then most people are going to have a bias that values being skinny over having a larger body. And so Mm -hmm. just understanding that we are not individually responsible for these problems, but we all can individually step up and take part in the solution. And so I like to tell people, if we start with our own biases, then it changes our one-to-one relationships, whether it be with our families, whether it be in our roles as teachers, our roles as managers, our roles as supervisors, executives, our roles as salespeople. I think that is where we all can have impact because not everyone is um, the high level decision maker, but everyone can change their bias and change how that, that impacts their interactions with their coworkers or with their colleagues or with their co- clients and collaborators. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. What a, um, what a beautiful and elegant thing to just start with ourselves. Awesome. <laughs> so good. So yeah. good. I, I, Cause well, I mean, good heavens. I've been consulting with leaders for 14 years and mm-hmm. they were like, I want to th- see things get better, but then it's like, Holy cow, how am I going to actually make this happen? Change right. management's a real deal. Right. But for mm-hmm. ourselves, it can be as easy as just being aware of it. Right. Just like when you Absolutely. first explained to me colorism. And then the next time I happened to like really see like a big advertisement poster and I'm like, it literally stopped me in my track. I'm like, mm-hmm. I actually wanted to turn to the person, you know, other people like, do you re- like, do you see that they purposely picked a lighter mm-hmm. scone, lighter skin tone black lady for this? Like, yeah. do you, you know what I mean? Like, yes. do you see 
hours, you know? And so, but it just is that little, that little bit of a shift. And now, like you said, I can't not see it. Right. Mm -hmm. But then just being aware of those other biases and that whole, that, um, not, um, external race, but even internal race. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, no, I, I totally get it. I've done some, um, consulting with groups and, and, and I've had senior executives say, I'm seeing race on race, um, racism happening, you know, you know, inside of them. And I'm not happy. I'm not okay with this. This isn't good. Right. And And I think for them having a word like colorism, right. Can empower them as leaders, right. To want to articulate and then seek to redress what they're seeing happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's, I think it's awesome. It's so good. Um, we know that I'm super passionate about, about compassion and that compassion in the workplace is a big, big, big deal. I'm curious your take on it coming from the colorism lens. How do you see compassion and colorism fitting together or, or, or not fitting together? What's, what's your take on that? Mm -hmm. So I, I like to apply compassion in sort of what I was speaking to about not placing a stigma on the fact that we have privilege And so self-compassion, right? Not beating ourselves up or judging ourselves or falling into this cycle of of guilt and shame because we might've had biases in the past or because we have more privilege than our neighbors maybe, right? And so having the self-compassion again to realize, you know, I didn't create this problem. And once we have that self-compassion, we're actually in a better position to act accordingly, right? Like now that I see this, now that I see I've had a bias or now that I see that I have more privilege than my neighbor, um, practicing self-compassion then allows allows me and empowers me to create a positive change that I would hope to create. Mm -hmm. But also having compassion for others in these conversations and as we strive to do this work collectively and realizing that they other people also are not to blame for the problem. They're not the source of the problem, right? And so we can have accountability in saying, you know, let's all be responsible for how we show up. Let's all be responsible for the things that we say and for how we treat each other. But these larger systemic society-wide problems did not stem from any one person or any one individual, especially not anyone who's alive today, right? (laughs) Maybe if we were, you know, back in the 1400s, we can say, oh, you as a specific person created this problem. But certainly today- (laughs) We can't, you know, always pinpoint like an individual as a system, as the source of a systemic problem. And so having compassion for people, um, especially when we see concerted, genuine efforts to engage in that process of change. And I think that's really all we can ask of ourselves and of, of each other is, are we consistently putting forth genuine effort to engage in these processes of change? Because I can't force someone else to have to evolve on my timeline, right? I, and you can't force me to evolve on your timeline. Like the the time it takes me to understand something is just the time that it's gonna take me to understand it or to you know, self-correct or course correct where necessary. Um, and then the other thing I'll say too, in terms of self-compassion is realizing that we always have to be assessing and, and self-reflecting about where we've grown, how we've grown, and then all the opportunities that we still have to grow and learn even further. Because it never stops people. It never stops. (laughs) Yeah. This is, I mean, this is one piece of the, you know, one slice of life, right? We think of a whole, you know, pie. It's like, there's all these things to consider. So, oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. As we're wrapping up, what's one pearl of wisdom that you would like to share with the leaders who are listening to this to help them to understand more about colorism or whatever? What's that one thing you really want them to get today? I'm going to offer a statement that I'm I'm trying to say more often so that it spreads across society, which is we might've all heard the phrase or are likely have heard the phrase that race is a social construct. And that is actually true. Race as we know it, race as it's practiced in our society today, today is a social construct. But skin tone, a person's actual complexion, the amount of pigmentation, the amount of melanin that they have in their skin, that is a biological fact. But it's a biological fact that has socially constructed meanings. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about something like colorism, we all have to understand what are the socially constructed meanings that we assign or attribute to people based on their skin tones, based on their hair textures, and based on any other number of factors. And I think that 
hopefully will, you know, elucidate some of the dynamics of colorism as it's playing out in people's workplaces and companies and organizations. So good. Sarah, thank you so much. What's the one good place that people can find you? Colorismhealing.com, C-O-L-O-R-I-S-M-H-E-A-L-I-N-G.com. Perfect. Thank you. We'll make sure to make that link available as well in the show notes. Thank you. Dr. Sarah Webb, thank you so much for joining me today on today's Top Leaders. It was my pleasure.